Here's a question. When did the Legend of Zelda games become so massive in scale? No, 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 scratch that. The actual question is, when was the exact moment the Legend of Zelda games felt so massive? In recent Legend of Zelda titles, especially in the back half of the 2010s, unless you know where to warp or travel by air or horse, walking to a village could take a chunk of time spent doing anything else, a fairly solvable problem given the many ways of transportation, including this lovely little convenient bike. And yet, at least from where I sit, the world of Hyrule seemed to have gotten bigger with the passing of time. And after I explored all of Hyrule and Zelda games released decades ago, if I replayed say, Breath of the Wild, there was always something else to find or some other task to do besides the various side quests or maybe come across another Korok seed to get that sweet 100 completion percentage. Why did they just count side quests towards the percentage? I don't know. But was it always the case that there was more to Hyrule? I say this because I am trying to put myself in the shoes of a kid growing up not in the 2010s and who would be wowed by the depths and skies and tears of the kingdom, or maybe even a 2000s kid who wandered around the seas in the Wind Waker. I'm talking an 80s to 90s gamer kid, aka yours truly, back when game development was evolving with new innovations coming out with each year, and different unique ways to code programs and engines on ancient computers, and when Nintendo was making a name for itself as a premier gaming console company. It's hard to believe now that games released in those times must have felt like hiking the most impossible mountain to navigate there and back for gamers. If only Nintendo just let the guys at id Software work on a PC version of Super Mario 3, and maybe find some way to bring in a human robot like John Carmack to work on their engines, but enough about the what-ifs. Yet, sometimes I think we're guilty of taking the past for granted, and seeing retro games as more like historical pieces you would put in a gaming museum, and less of innovation which wowed gamers and programmers alike back then. Of course, since this is another video essay on arguably Nintendo's premier franchise, besides the one with the jumping Italian plumber, my go-to example for classic Zelda retro games is either Ocarina of Time or A Link to the Past. And while I discuss some issues with the former game in my Star Fox 64 retrospective, I cannot deny what a giant leap Ocarina was and how incredible it must have felt seeing Link go through a coming-of-age journey involving time travel and an increasingly enriching mythology featuring the Seven Sages, which reminds me, ahem. <clears throat> hey kids, gather around and let me tell you all about the imprisoning I remember being able to rent the game out at a local blockbuster and just being stunned by how the graphics looked and being more impressed playing the game than my first gameplay with Super Mario 64. That gleeful music you hear as you gather your sword and shield before meeting the Deku Tree, the Gerudo form of Ganondorf at the organ playing his theme before an epic fight. These moments only helped to develop what once were pixelated beings with little thought for much depth. But while my actual first Legend of Zelda game was a brief open and closed playthrough of Link's Awakening on my Game Boy, it was the release of A Link to the Past on the SNES when it was the first time I really got Zelda games and where I felt I could be the hero in this tale. Besides, of course, the ability to put my name in a save file. Screw it, I'm still calling Link Link. In A Link to the Past, each location in the overworld was a breeze to get to, given the three to four hours of gameplay it takes to beat it. The 2D graphics, colorful in its palette, and NPCs which could mold well with Middle Earth, and more realized versions of Link, Zelda, and Ganon, even if Zelda was still relegated to being just a princess. You could say that, despite still relying on 2D graphics and being set in different parts of the official series timeline, A Link to the Past felt like the fully formed version of of a Zelda game released long before, and uh, no, not The Avengers of Link, thankfully. But, none of this truly answers the opening question of this video essay. When was the moment that the world of Hyrule felt so large despite its small map size? Was it a link to the past as the overworld became more colorful and our hero Link traveled between two worlds and dealt with a big blue boar disguised as a wizard? Maybe Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask and getting to know the Goron folk?
joke. I say all this because I believe this conversation is worth having, given the hoo-ha over how big is too big talk which came along with the not even a year old release of Tears of the Kingdom, the follow-up to Breath of the Wild and how we came to this with both games sitting at the bottom of the series' official timeline. Of course, this conversation over how massive should open-world gameplay be could carry over for hours on end, but regardless. Look, I am not gonna say Tears of the Kingdom is overrated or I hate it or I think the majority of gaming publications universally declaring this to be one of the greatest Zelda games ever are being insufferable, because I don't think that way. There are things I like, check that love about Tears of the Kingdom, which I'll reserve my full thoughts for another time, but I'm not gonna beat around the bush, and I will be honest when I say, Tears of the Kingdom is the first Zelda game in which the word overwhelming should be the game's tagline, and the first Zelda title I had to completely pause for months while mid-game, besides my usual two to three months summer break from gaming. Not a completely unbeatable game. Hell, the bosses have their weak spots, and yes, navigating Hyrule gets easier even if it takes more time, but man, there's just so much to go through that I think my teenage self trying to beat the whole Vice City game would have fell asleep to this, and not be able to fully appreciate the experience of playing Tears of the Kingdom. Then again, my teenage self probably thought Zelda games weren't real games, very mature of me. This feeling of being bombarded with too much to navigate around and having to do a long to-do list around Hyrule wasn't there throughout my first playthroughs of Breath of the Wild. There was a lot there, but it was straightforward, and straightforward could also mean having an easier time beating Calamity Ganon in short time, within like a half an hour. However, one consensus amongst critics and casual gamers became clear. Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild share the same level of freedom as the 1986 original Legend of Zelda game, with an asterisk, especially for the first ever Zelda game. Which is weird for me to point out, because unlike the two recent Zelda titles, the OG Legend of Zelda is roughly a 2-3 to three hour breeze for a majority of gamers if you know how to navigate and beat it. If you memorize where to place each bomb to get to a cave, which tree to burn to find a hidden staircase, and how to deal with each dungeon's boss. And all that is easy to say, especially now at a time when no commentary walkthrough videos are a click away. But while there's no doubt OG Zelda has its share of difficulty which shows itself when trying to find secrets and additional hearts as well as going through dungeons, the method of letting walkthroughs hold your hand, so to speak, has the side effect of limiting the amount of curiosity new gamers will have, which is a contrast to how kids must have felt when The Legend of Zelda first arrived in 1986. It's easy to forget that new gamers are afforded the privilege of a broad, expansive internet. Back in the 80s, there weren't any helpful maps and strategy guides provided by IGN or Polygon or any Zelda Wikipedia to tell you which tree to burn, or where on a wall or cliff do you place a bomb or which statue is hiding the stairs, or when is it appropriate or strategic to buy or use a potion while navigating a dungeon, and when is it appropriate for Link to drink one. For kids who first played this game in the late 1980s, The Legend of Zelda was probably the first time gamers had to say fuck it and just wing it through Hyrule without a shred of a clue. When exactly should you go through level 8? Because OG Zelda isn't exactly a linear game, story-wise or strategically. Oh, there's a way to beat it now in an orderly fashion agreed upon by gamers and walkthroughs. But no one is stopping you from walking into any dungeon, three hearts and all, from slashing enemies and bosses only to run out of hearts and restart again, and go as far without enough keys. But that fuck it and just play it mindset is part of why games like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, while not 100% flawless, are rewarding, and definitely more accessible for newbie Zelda gamers. Because this game makes it clear you are both your own warrior and your own explorer. Legendary programmer John Carmack once said, as recalled in the fantastic Masters of Doom, Story in a game is like a story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not that important. Maybe this quote triggers me, as someone who is a very story-intensive gamer who can dive deep into games for hours, but put yourself in the shoes of gamers when OG Zelda arrived, and you would probably find that kids in the 80s were less focused on what exactly is a Triforce and what does Ganon gain from holding onto it before Link fights him. Because it was the gameplay, how you got through Hyrule and how you beat enemies that they were focused on. Heck, back then, OG Zelda made it clear you could be the hero of the game just by typing in your own name before opening a game file. Even if you, like me, didn't mind playing a non-traditionally male protagonist with feminine features, which should be commended given how it departs from traditional depiction of male heroes in games. And this was before the link of modern games was depicted with more gender-neutral features. See also, Nintendo's own Mario, depicted as not exactly physical 
physically fit, but as a working class plumber who can barge through Bowser's castle with no problem. All of this is why, for any gamer and fan of the Legend of Zelda series, it's worth looking back, and I mean way, way, way back, to the father of all Zelda games, the original 1986 Legend of Zelda game. Keep it simple. It's a motto old games followed to a T, long before the massive fictional worlds depicting a view of the Wild West, a beach city inspired by Miami Beach, a metropolis like Liberty City and GTA 3, and of course, Hyrule. From your mind figuring out how to compute which piece goes where in Tetris, keeping your eye on the ball to beat your opponent in Pong, or eating fruits, ghosts, and dots in Pac-Man. Hell, since I brought up that Carmack quote last chapter, first-person shooters of old like id Software's Wolf Stein 3D, Doom, and Quake put the action into your virtual first-person hands, and each of the three retrospective series stories haven't entirely forgotten that story is not the selling point in these cases, and thus a simple premise rewards replayability. And every game, old and new, can be broken down to its simple premise and mechanics. Modern AAA and indie games go through this breakdown despite the increased emphasis on story and character development and mission objective complexity. The feeling of intimidation a lot of gamers feel when opening up a new game eases with practice for hours on end, like a kid learning how to ride a bike or a teenager learning to drive a car before passing their driver's license exam and before their inevitable first driving ticket within a year of earning their license. Come on, admit it, a lot of us first year drivers went through that after we got our license. That feeling of intimidation in a game like Celeste at first glance diminishes as the player learns how to navigate, never mind how the personal real-life journey behind the story in Celeste shines the main theme of overcoming depression into a whole new light. Cuphead might be responsible for an incalculable number of controllers broken due to the game's difficulty, but its formula of side-scrolling and running gunning added a flavor to a familiar genre of gaming while successfully combining a throwback to Golden Age animation. Speaking further on how games of old inspired modern indie games, I wrote and produced a video essay on the always replayable Hyperlight Drifter in March of last year, and how it owes its influence not just the 16-bit era of gaming which brought us the link to the past from the Legend of Zelda series, but also from the films of Hayao Miyazaki, as depicted in how the game dives into themes of mortality, despite the lack of game dialogue apart from the incredible visual storytelling and art design. This is especially the case for Hollow Knight, which came out a year after Hyperlight Drifter, and in the same year as Breath of the Wild, and Hollow Knight's themes of mortality, free will, and morality would be nothing if it was just a mediocre Dark Souls-inspired Metroidvania in a long line of games in the genre. Dealing with video game lore and themes is the fun, meaty discussion which can go on for hours, but these games would not be successful if they forgot to keep it simple for gamers. And that motto applies to the entire Legend of Zelda series. We can go on and on about the philosophical and theological themes in the series, the heroes journey, the not-too-complicated morality of good versus evil in Hyrule, along with Ganon slash Ganondorf being a representation of pure evil, especially considering his most recent depiction in Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> And even in, say, Skyward Sword, how a pre-Ganon villain-like demise helps to shape up the overall morality tale in Zelda. But, as any Zelda veteran knows, the journey to beating any Zelda game isn't complicated when the story is broken down. Rather, the world expanded over the years, as the objectives to complete the main quest along with additional side quests grew, as gamers got older and new gamers came into the series years later, some unaware of just how small Hyrule used to be. Gamers of today get getting introduced to the Legend of Zelda series by playing the very first game might be quick to ignore the game's manual, despite the scrolling introductory text of the game's start menu telling you to consult it. But for the purpose of this essay, I looked at the game's original manual provided by Nintendo's website, and apart from the fantastic animated art describing the game's story and providing tips, this sentence caught my attention. A long, long time ago, 
the world was in an age of chaos. You could say that this first sentence describing the backstory fits well with the fallen hero section of the series timeline, but I am inclined to think that this quote best describes the state of the Zelda series at that moment, or more accurately, the start of what was to become a premier gaming series for Nintendo, which according to the behind the scenes backstory, was initially conceived right around the development of the first Super Mario Brothers. Sure, the company was known for selling toys before the arrival of the NES, and okay, video games are, in a way, just mere toys if you don't put too much thought into them, but the gaming industry at the time, while still formulating new ideas and innovation, was scattershot with little to no footing for big name game designers or developers. If you want an escapism in high fantasy and fiction and imagine epic fights to the death and conflicts between good and evil, you would have to read Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy again and again to recapture those pleasures of imagination, but who in gaming prefers reading books over playing video games? Films also offered some brief excitement in the fantasy genre, if only for an hour or two. That is, until The Legend of Zelda arrived in 1986 to a warm reception, and 6.5 million copies sold. Of course, working with the technology at the time meant sacrifices had to be made to translate fantasy into Nintendo's virtual reality. That is, breaking down high fantasy to its simplicity. The prime example I would point to where the game's simplicity shows its positive colors, is in the design of Hyrule, aka the overworld, and the dungeons, aka the underworld. It's understandable that the final product is less to be desired at first playthrough than, say, A Link to the Past, given the technological limitations in the 80s. And yet, despite this, you can see for yourself the comparisons between the sketch drawings by the development team to the game's final levels, as provided by Nintendo's official website. It was clear it wasn't going to be magic that was going to figure this all out. It's impressive how it all looks when you compare these colorful, detailed illustrations in the game's manual to the game's layout of Hyrule and its labyrinthian dungeons. Keeping it simple meant working with what you had, but just because the game looks simple now compared to recent Zelda titles doesn't mean the game isn't difficult. As one Nintendo Times review of the original game put it in 1987, The Legend of Zelda is so big that you won't be able to beat it in a single sitting, or at least that was the case for 80s gamers. The original Legend of Zelda has a simple course for Link to go through. Collect the eight fragments of the Triforce of Wisdom, stop Ganon, rescue Zelda, and restore Hyrule. Seems simple enough. This hero's journey plays more or less the same for later Zelda titles, with a few differences here and there. Of course, the key word in the sentence is seems. Being the starting point of the series, the development team, and to an extent, fans of the game, didn't have thought for the series' official timeline. But given the lack of NPCs to interact with, apart from those hiding in caves or dungeons, the overworld is isolating and really feels like the world of Hyrule has fallen into darkness, despite the bright colors differentiating the overworld from the underworld. It's only appropriate that this game falls into the fallen hero timeline in the series. I will admit that for me, or maybe some of you watching, who not only like to enjoy playing video games, but also like reading literature. Putting the controller down for a few days during, say, Tears of the Kingdom or Breath of the Wild is the gaming equivalent of inserting a bookmark into a lengthy novel. You know you are going to have to come back to that novel because you have a commitment to finishing it, because you want to see the stormy final confrontation between Captain Ahab and the whale in Moby Dick. To get to the tragic family reunion during one last Midwest Christmas in the corrections, or maybe, eh, maybe forget Atlas Shrug. Wouldn't recommend it, unless you're like me and like to punish yourself. The need to feel that satisfaction in finishing a book or film is the same as finishing a video game, and in this case, the biggest reward in playing Nintendo games is finishing any of their games in the Legend of Zelda series, and thinking about my last video as I type this, I can hear Peppy Hair shout in my mind, NEVER GIVE UP! TRUST YOUR INSTINCTS! Even if that means taking a few moments away from your console. And me complimenting Nintendo like this is saying a lot considering the company's rather mixed reputation in the gaming community. Yet, some less patient gamers might call it pausing a game for a few days quitting, because some forms of entertainment require at least one sitting for a few hours. And today, the original Legend of Zelda fits that description with its roughly 2-3 to three hours of gameplay if you're familiar with it and know the objectives. 
I don't think that's always the case, and definitely not in today's world, where for most of us, sitting down to complete 20 straight hours of Breath of the Wild is not possible. Not every gamer can make their living memifying and then monetizing their Twitch stream, capturing every Korok seed, only to result in earning a pile of shit. Really. <laughs> However, for those with a lack of patience and want to complete a game within a few hours, there is no time for bookmarking in the original Legend of Zelda, at least for veterans of the series. Well, today, that is a lie. Turns out having a save state on your Nintendo Switch Online account is a pretty convenient way to bookmark your progress. But as far as trying to go back to when it was first released, there was no room to rest, no house you wake up in, and no campfire to rest for a few hours. It was just you and a dinky little sword you start out with when you first talk to the old man after he says the game's signature line. It's dangerous to go alone if you don't know where you're going, and most 80s gamers didn't know that. Again, this is an aspect of the game I and other modern gamers might take for granted unless you go into the original completely cold at first playthrough and say, didn't realize that you might be walking an endless staircase as shown here. Here's the thing. Modern critically acclaimed games like Celeste, Cuphead, and especially Hollow Knight are notorious for their difficulty, but that level of difficulty adds on to both the thematic elements of each respective game and the replay value of each game, especially in the case of Hollow Knight, where the difficulty of achieving the Dream No More ending of Hollow Knight or beating the Pantheon of Hollow Nest or P5 is in large part meta due to the knight, aka the player, having to struggle mask and nail to learn how to beat enemies like Absolute Radiance, Pure Vessel, Markov, and of course, the goat of all game character goats. The side effect of this struggle is that it feels rewarding. If you can beat these bosses or complete this platforming challenge, you could achieve anything. While I wouldn't say modern Zelda games hold the player's hand all the way to Ganon slash Ganondorf, by the time you get to the final boss after countless hours playing, you are likely stocked with enough hearts, stamina, weapons including the master sword, bows and arrows, shields, and plenty of elixirs and meals to make the final boss fight a cakewalk. This isn't always the case, especially for speedrunners trying to clock their Breath of the Wild run under a half an hour. And so the fight to Ganon is just a walk away, and because this is a riskier move, it becomes a literal fight to the death. But even without the added challenge of speedrunning, no Zelda game felt more like a struggle than the back half of the original game, especially level 6 to 9 up until the final Ganon fight. Maybe it was feeling a little cocky, as the simplicity of the NES mechanics might give you the impression that this is a piece of cake. OG Zelda is almost pure action. There are no meals to give you hearts and added yellow ones, no special elixirs to deal with the monsters. Using your inventory menu wasn't simply to pause action, it was me being strategic. You have to know when to use the magic flute, or according to the game's manual, a whistle, how you can escape enemies using the ladder to evade water, and to quote the man himself, Use bombs wisely! to find secrets and doorways around Hyrule and its dungeons. Otherwise, you'll run out of rupees fast if you're bombing every wall and cliff, or maybe even wasting arrows since they cost rupees. See also potions, which come in two varieties, with the latter having two doses to heal you fully, though again, you'd be wise not to waste it. This makes the appearance of simple gameplay of The Legend of Zelda and its NES controller mechanics even more deceptive, because modern gamers familiar with Breath of the Wild, like myself, have the tendency to take pausing to check your inventory for granted. To use an obvious point of comparison from another Nintendo franchise, the original Super Mario Bros. game was as simple as it gets for 80s games, and yet, just like OG Legend of Zelda, if you paid enough attention, you could find secrets that would ease your gaming experience, and, in the case of Mario's level design, might be lucky to find a shortcut, especially if you're a dedicated speedrunner and know your pipes. Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, though, while their depiction of Hyrule is more or less using the same map, these games have the tendency to give away a secret here and there, especially in Tears of the Kingdom, where the obvious off-looking pile of rocks with cracks in them will lead you to a cave, or one of those green shards of crystal emitting a green light taking you to a shrine location. But, there's no guide in the original game. The old man might give you a clue here and there in the dungeons, but OG Zelda's emphasis on telling a non-linear story to complete your journey means you could be on your own for hours trying to find the next dungeon, 
especially in the latter half of gameplay. When gamers describe the legacy of such an influential game, the original Legend of Zelda's simplicity should always be described with an asterisk. Simple 8-bit graphics, simple grid map of Hyrule, simple 8-bit soundtrack, simple character designs for Link the Old Man, the old lady named Impa, simple designs for the weapons, including the magical sword and the various enemy sprites and bosses. Yet, this simplicity comes with a flip side. I don't think gamers in the 80s paid any mind that there was little to no character depth for the old man, the old lady, Link, and Zelda, a consequence of the technological limitations nearly 40 years ago, or fully formed versions of the enemies or bosses. Even the moment you get the magical sword doesn't feel as earned or cinematic as in previous games, starting with A Link to the Past. Hell, the trademark sword of the game, in fact, the series, wasn't even called the Master Sword at this point. And yet, despite these trivial nitpicks I have as someone who grew up with the series, little did anyone at Nintendo know that the mere wish fulfillment of being your own hero was planted like flower seeds covered in soil waiting for the rain and fully grown years later. This deceptive simplicity can also apply to the game mechanics, mainly modern gamers switching from modern controllers to trying out an NES controller. See, for example, the release of the NES Classic Edition some years ago. Or, if you want to be more stressed, learning the game's mapping on your Nintendo Switch controller. If you have Nintendo Switch Online, like I do, you might find that trying to play OG Zelda with modern Switch controls can be a temporary annoyance, though it's manageable. When in combat, you might tell yourself not to use the left joystick on your Switch controllers since controlling Link can be a little unstable with movement, and instead use the arrow buttons below the joystick, only to forget when you're in panic mode and stuck in a corner trying to avoid whiz robes or dark nuts or maybe the bubbles which will stun you for a few seconds. Believe me, I've made this mistake plenty of times when exploring many rooms in the game's dungeons. The silver lining of persevering through the original game's dungeons, i.e. arguably the easiest aspect of completing the game is, with the exception of Death Mountain aka level 9, is beating each of the dungeon's bosses besides the final fight with Ganon. Their variety and design sets them apart, yet their attacks are mostly avoidable, though again, you might be in a panic if you're low on health and unsure when it's time to use a potion. However, with a little thinking, you might find that it's not difficult to exploit their weak spots before earning a new heart and a piece of the Triforce. To give a few examples, the Dragonite looks like Aquamentus, with his non-threatening horn on his head, needs just a few swings of your sword in the first and seventh dungeons. The many Dudongos need to be fed two bombs directly into their mouths to destroy them. The Manhandla needs its four claws sliced once, though with each sliced claw this beast becomes more erratic. But the most hilarious boss fight is the Dig Docker. Sure, it might have a big eye just like Goma, but its weakness isn't your magical sword, bombs, or arrows, but your magical whistle. Playing it once reduces it to a smaller size for you to kill. Though, when it reappears later in the game, there'll be three of those mini ones for you to kill. I suppose the creative team behind the game thought that trying to plow through enemies in each of the dungeon's rooms and getting lost before a boss fight would be the real struggle, so it was nice to be given a breather after mostly easy boss fights. Yet, some enemies and bosses are mere skeletons of what was to become of them decades later. For example, Lynels in OG Zelda are easier to deal with than in the last two Zelda games games, and definitely not as thrilling or exciting of a fight. Gleok in OG Zelda is a blueprint for its many variations in Tears of the Kingdom, especially its King Gleok form. Yet, in the original game, his design and initial encounter is disappointing, popping out a floating head if you slice one of them, only for it to just bounce around. Once you've completed the eight dungeons and collected the eight Triforce fragments, you can make your way to the game's ultimate test, Death Mountain. Up to this point, if you've explored any of the previous dungeons before, chances are you're used to making treks there and back without a map and relying on your memory going there and back again, and it helps that your inventory when you press start lets you see a mini-map of the progress you've made in the dungeon before obtaining the dungeon's compass and map. However, not only is Death Mountain the biggest of the levels and the most difficult to navigate, but as in the case with levels 6 to 8, this area forces you to think carefully about when you need your first and second doses of potion, as the final boss fight can be costly for your health if you're ill-prepared. On the one hand, if you're lucky going into Death Mountain, you might walk into a room full of keys and zoles which are easy to deal with. On the other, lots and lots of whiz robes await you in many rooms. 
I never thought I would hate Wizworld so much considering they're a nuisance in the two recent Zelda games, and don't even get me started on how annoying the rotating Patra is, serving as less of an enemy and more like a boss fight. Thankfully, the big blue boar himself, Ganon, like all the bosses, is an easy boss fight if you can figure out where his big blue invisible boar body is when he disappears. Otherwise, if you don't know what you're doing like I did the first time I fought him, you can kiss your red tunic ass goodbye. But once you expose him with a slice of your sword four times, all you need to do is hit him with one silver arrow and he's done, son. Then you can rescue Zelda from a flame barrier and, in a rather anticlimactic manner, the journey of Link restoring Hyrule is over. Of course, later Zelda titles would add more flair to their endings, but still, considering the emerging gaming market at the time, there really was nothing quite like this journey. The greatest compliment you can say about the original Legend of Zelda is that the gaming experience of being your own fantasy hero could be defined by the game's freedom. Despite the limited grid layout of Hyrule and the lack of a map of the world, there's nobody to tell you when it's time to start collecting Triforce fragments, as the entire grid map is open for you to explore and get used to. This is especially true for newbie gamers who will have to get used to shortcutting your way to one dungeon or another. Not only that, but if you're that much of a god gamer, you don't necessarily have to collect all the hearts for maximum health towards the end of your save run, a feature which has carried over into later Zelda titles. Thusly, as is the case in most games in the series, be your own hero in the original Legend of Zelda means going your own path. Of course, this freedom comes with its consequences. Case in point, by chance I found the lion, aka level 8, when I was toying with fire around bushes and found a staircase below assuming I might find another secret containing rupees or a potion only for me to get mowed down in a room full of blue dark nuts because I was ill-prepared for the encounter. Another fond memory of struggling to beat The Legend of Zelda was going on a bit of a streak and making it through the level 2 and 3 dungeons and bosses, then heading over to the level 4 dungeon only to realize that I was missing a key to get to the level 4 boss, and searching through the previous two dungeons to find it. Being an older adult myself, I could imagine my pre-teenage self wanting to throw my Nintendo system across the room, screaming out loud and ruining a valuable gaming system without sitting back and thinking for a moment. Of course, I just retraced my steps and made my way back, but that goes to show you why the original Zelda game is a prime example of a game where being able to have freedom in your journey doesn't mean you can afford to skip a beat. See also, almost a decade after the original game's release, playing a Psy Impossible playthrough on System Shock 2, where cyber modules become a necessity to find and for which you cannot afford to waste if you want to be a psychic god. In my last video game video essay on The Legend of Zelda from last April, I had mentioned how Link is literally the link between the gamer and the protagonist. It's a compliment that these games try to capture something real, something that we yearn for, a world that which we should try to explore for ourselves and become the link between our small, brief lives and the whole world. Nintendo had a heavy burden trying to present such a unique product, and for gamers back then, the journey to beating the first Zelda must have been the heaviest burden for their young lives. The gaming world in the 1980s could not have predicted the many twists and turns The Legend of Zelda would take if you judge the series based on the first game. As one of the faces of Nintendo, Shigeru Miyamoto stated, gamers would take on average 40 hours to complete it the first time. Perhaps it was because of the hours of frustration and getting lost in the world of Hyrule that prolonged the average gamer's journey, or maybe it was because the world was inching closer to a world that we could interact with that our meager little lives could never be present in. Today, the original Legend of Zelda is more of an historical document rather than a pleasurable gaming experience, and to be honest, was the first Zelda game I played in which the word pleasurable should never be used, especially once you step foot into areas like level 6 and have to suffer through the various whiz robes. Nevertheless, man, despite the almost completely unforgiving nature of this game, you can see with fresh eyes today where this franchise was going to go. The world of Hyrule back then 
Batman looked plain and dull with the simple pixelated art design. But take a step back for a moment and you can fill all of the gaps and be wowed that the team behind this game pulled off the impossible and with modern gaming technology, i.e. the ability to play this game through Nintendo Switch Online or the NES Classic Edition, or if you were a child of the 80s looking to dust off and refurbish your Nintendo Entertainment System and pass it off to your own children or maybe even your grandkids, younger generations and beyond will know what it feels like to be the hero of the story. Well, hello again. If you made it this far, let me extend a personal and belated Happy New Year, uh, this being the first video of the new year and all. And thank you all so very much for taking the time to watch this shorter than usual video game video essay. Bit of a breather for now before we get into meteor subjects and various pieces of art and entertainment. With the next video game video essays on this channel, critiquing some more modern games like Firewatch and Dave the Diver and then some. Hopefully I can try to squeeze in more shorter video essays like this in between some of the long 30 minute to an hour plus video essays which require a lot more in-depth discussion and analysis. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video essay, please give it a like, comment to discuss OG Zelda in the comments section below, share this video on social media if you like, and if you'd like to further support the work I do, please consider subscribing to the Armchair Brain YouTube channel by pressing subscribe and ring the bell as well to be notified when new videos premiere. And follow me on Twitch, Blue Sky, and my brand spanking new TikTok account. Any support is greatly appreciated. Looking forward to seeing you all later.